talked about getting a grant, right? Saying, oh, I need $500,000. But then when the investor is sitting in front of you and they say, okay, well, tell me how you're going to spend every single penny of it. Solid answer. Not just, oh, we're going to spend about 10000 here, about 20000 here, you know? I remember our first couple of investors meeting and we just got destroyed, man. Welcome to the Physician Pharmacist Podcast, a show designed to shed some light on a very unusual pathway into medicine. I'm your host, Nathan Garland. I'm a licensed pharmacist and third-year medical student. I'm also the author of PharmD to MD and the owner of the Physician Pharmacist Company. As this podcast has grown, we've had tremendous opportunity to broaden our scope and explore other non-traditional pharmacy careers. The PharmD opens so many doors, and by listening in, you can learn from experts in the field how to take your first steps. In today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Nook Chen. Nook Chen is a licensed and supervising pharmacist currently practicing in retail. He's also the founder of Nooksel, a revolutionary startup company that has combined pharmaceutical expertise with biomedical engineering to create a reliable quick mix syringe. This novel design decreases product preparation time, minimizes drug waste, increases product lifespan, and removes human error from the equation. Very excited to have Dr. Nook Chen on the episode today. All righty. Welcome to the show, Dr. Chen. Thanks for having me. All right. Happy to have you on the show. And that was a you know pretty long introduction right there. So l- let's take things way back. What When did you start having an interest in the profession of pharmacy? Yeah, you know, it, uh, it went back from, um, honestly, from like high school. I, I always know whatever I did, I wanted to be a part of the community. You know, I, um, and what better way than a pharmacist, right? Thinking about how many uh, patients we're exposed to every day. Um, so yeah, it was just it was just the perfect option. You know, it was like it matches with what I wanted to do, my passion, and work. And, and did you do like a two plus four program, or did you do like a four plus four or something different? Yeah, so I actually um, I got my bachelor first. And then I went into pharmacy school. So it took me three years to get my bachelor and then four years to get my PharmD. Nice. So you ended up doing that bachelor at uh, a shorter interval, actually, than most people. Most people end up having to do four years before applying to pharmacy school. Was that like a unique program to your pharmacy school or, or to your undergraduate university? No, I went in. I went into college with a good amount of um, courses, um, college credit from like APs and then uh, kind of honestly loaded up because I knew I wanted to finish early. So I was able to do a little bit more than 18 credits each semester. And then eventually, you know, got to that three years mark. Wow. That's perfect. That, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people who did four years are probably wishing they, they, they did the same thing, but that's great. And yeah, that was uh, that saved a lot of money for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so while you were in pharmacy school, did you ever have an interest in uh, like fellowships or anything along, along those lines? Cause I know you have a strong interest in pharmaceutical development. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I definitely thought about it, but again, I just really, after being done with um, pharmacy school, I wanted to be, you know, immediately um, dive into the community. Um, so it made the most sense at the time to go straight into work, the workforce, and not kind of take it from there. Um, definitely thought about residency and fellowship, but really what I wanted and what I wanted to do with life was, you know, be in the community part. So I'm glad I chose to do that. You know, I definitely don't have any regret. So, yeah. Fantastic. And yeah, especially with fellowships, they can take, you know, two years sometimes. And it's just sounds like you wanted to get out there and and start working as a pharmacist and and connect with that that community. And so. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so after graduation, and and this was in 2021, I believe, you entered the world of retail pharmacy, uh, like you've been kind of alluding. And what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, it's, you know, I, uh, so the, uh, the pharmacy I'm working at right now is where I did my internship, right? So, I, and I think that played a big part on um, why I didn't pursue residency or fellowship. I kind of knew exactly what I was getting myself into. And, um, and I just, you know, really one of those uh, pharmacists, I just really enjoy community pharmacy. So um, right at the end, I definitely want to just jump out and just um, drive deep uh, headfirst into the community field. So. 
That's great. And what do you love so much about the community pharmacy? Just connecting with patients or kind of having those like longitudinal relationships? Yeah, I, th I think it's um, connecting that patient. You know, I think there's, it brings like every, brings a certain um, satisfactory knowing like having a face to the per uh, people you're helping, you know, uh, it's gotten to the point. So I'm at my the site I practice at right now. I'm there for two years now. And, you know, I, I, I can tell when, when my patients are coming in and they're like peeping their head over and they're like, oh, like you can, I can tell that person is looking for me, you know, and they don't want to talk to anybody else. They just want to talk to me. And it just, you know, it feels great going to work, knowing that those are the kind of like people waiting for you there every day. So that's, that's what I love most about community, really. I love that. And so what's your current role then uh, working in the community pharmacy? I, I take it that you've kind of moved up a level at this point. Yeah, so I started at, um, as a staff, and then I uh, I just got supervising pharmacists um, back in August. You know, so that's definitely a big a big change for me. So um, currently, right now, we're, we're a pretty big pharmacy. You know, I have seven other pharmacists right under me, and then and we do honestly, we do over eight thousand scripts a week. So we are we're wow. pretty we're pretty up there. Wow, that's that's quite a bit of work to, to deal with. And and what's it like managing all these other pharmacists? I'm sure that's like a lot of responsibility on top of working full time. Right. It's awesome. You know, I think uh the pharmacists that I work with, they have years of experience. So, you know, like they're they're there for like honestly to set me up for success. So it's not it's not that hard. They they do the majority of their work, you know. <laughs> They make your job easy when you're working with rock stars who, who know their stuff. Absolutely. So. You said it yourself. <laughs> All righty. Well, I think that serves as pretty much of a short background of, you know, what you, why you got into pharmacy and your current role and what you're doing. But I think the primary discussion, what a lot of people are going to be interested in hearing about is how you started a pharmaceutical company, uh, essentially. And so I, I want to take things, I guess, back to, you know, the origin story of how, why did you start Nuxel and where did this idea come from in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. So I got into um, designing syringes um, back in my third year of pharmacy school. You know, I remember when I was uh, as an intern, we do, we do a lot of vaccination. And um, one of the vaccination we do is for um, for shingles. Right. And the, the process requires you have a little you have a little two little vial, you know, and you basically have a liquid component, a dry component, and you would mix them together and then you would go and give it to the patient and and it, it was just time consuming you know and I, you would I, I always thought to myself it's got to be an easier way and worst case scenario is you you mix it and you get in there and then there's a contraindication or the patient doesn't want it anymore you know and you just lost about two hundred dollars um on average i believe most pharmacy makes somewhere around you know ten to fifteen dollars per um vaccination right so you're thinking about it and you just you have one patient that doesn't want it you just lost 20 20 shots there the last 20 shots you just did pointless right then i went into the hospital field and i remember there is so many um antibiotics that needed reconstitution and similar process you know if you don't use it or it expires it's down the drain that's so i just thought and i kept thinking to myself it's got to be an easy way and then eventually you know as i can progress in my um, pharmacist career i realized there wasn't an easier way you know, and that's, that's where the idea came from. And that's where kind of the, the spark. Yeah. And I, I think that's super interesting. You kind of, you know, recognize that there is a deficiency in the market or there's a, a problem that could have real economic and patient centered outcomes that could be improved. And so not only, I guess, I think it's, one, it's very easy for individuals who are creative to maybe fantasize about creating a product or kind of filling in a niche market, but I think it shows a lot of grit when an individual actually acts on that particular, um, you know, ambition. And so what motivated you to move from just something on paper or just an idea in your head to the next step along this process? Right. I mean, you know, I, I went into the field for a reason, right? And I, that was my passion to help people, um, rather that be my patient or honestly, my colleague, you know, I was like, and I just, like I said, I just kept thinking like, wow, that's got to be an easier way to help people, you know, to help pharmacists, you know, um, that I got there's And really, that, that's probably the biggest motivation is trying to help my colleague and trying to help my patient, I would say. Love that. And so using that, that strong motivator right there to kind of in, introduce this product to the market, 
you obviously had the idea, you wanted to move forward with it because you had some good motivations, like I just mentioned. So I, I think though, like a lot of entrepreneurs struggle sometimes to relinquish some of the power or creative control when it comes to like building upon their ideas. And it's often, you know, a really, I guess it's the really good ones who recognize their own limitations when it comes to outsourcing some of the workload or kind of taking things to the next level. So, you know, I think, how did you go about finding someone who would then help create the product that you were trying to, to build? Right. So that's a great question. Um, so right now I have a business partner. His name's Sean Kai. Uh, he's an awesome guy, you know, extremely talented. Um, and I actually met him through one of my buddy from high school. He was roommate with one of my friends from high school. And, you know, and I remember like one of my friends was like, so I was telling, you know, at, at, you know, when I first came up with this idea, like I was obsessed with it, right? That's literally all I would talk about to anyone who would listen. It's all I would talk about. So I remember um, my buddy who um, from high school came in back in town and, and he was like, and I'm just talking and talking and talking. He was like, dude, you know who would, you know who would really love this conversation? Well, first, not me, but I know someone who would, right? Um, <laughs> and then he introduced me to his, uh, his roommate, which was Sean. And then it just, honestly, we just clicked, you know? Um, I remember, so there's a program called Blender. And Blender is, like, very similar to CAD, but it's free, right? And I was spending, honestly, like, I was spending probably a good 15, 20 hours a week just learning Blender and how to, so, cause it's a free program and they're just watching YouTube videos over and over again. And I remember, you know, sending Sean a picture of what I made on Blender. And he was like, wow, I, I, he's like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. I think I know what you want. And then he did a very similar design on CAD or SolidWorks was what he used and sent it over. And it was like leaps and bounds better than what I made. You know, I just spent 20 hours on something. He did it in about half an hour, sent it over. And I was like, holy crap, this guy is talented. And just being able to recognize you, like you said, recognizing your limitation and identifying the talents that are around you, you know? Um, so instantly we, we clicked and, you know, as I was giving him feedback and he was just, he was just changing stuff exactly the way I wanted, even though I knew I wasn't verbalizing what I wanted, like, you know, clearly. So Finding that someone who's just as motivated as you and finding that someone who's just, you know, who knows exactly what they're doing definitely made the process easier. Absolutely. So it sounds like you, you had a pretty good connection there that kind of brought Sean into the mix uh, and everything like that. And so he has a background in biomedical engineering is what I take it. And you obviously have the pharmaceutical background. So it sounds like the perfect kind of merger of skill set to, you know, what kind of uh, formulations are going to be, um, you know, utilized in the product design and you have like the schematics and the idea and how it would be used in clinical practice that's like your expertise and background and it sounds like sean obviously knows how to actually create the product and take the materials and build a prototype and so after you guys had met each other and he kind of designed this product in the, the software what was the next step for you um so after we you know the next step was finding funding I think that was probably our biggest part, um, finding the seed funding, you know. So luckily, we, Sean had uh, his, he had a 3D printer. So we were able to make a prototype pretty easily um, right after. And actually, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. As soon as we finalized our, I shouldn't say finalized, but as soon as we came up with the design, uh, we filed for a patent um, pretty much right away. You know, and then while that's running in the background, we found seed funding. So, um, you know, investors that had the same um, idea as what we did, you know, so that was the next step. So you filed for a patent, but I'm curious to know how many trials, uh, like design trials, did you guys go through? How many different, for, I guess, like product, final product designs did it take to finally get to the one that you actually wanted to market and patent? Yeah, so, oh, man, I honestly lost count. I can tell you uh, over 50, you know, probably closer to 100 design. Uh, and they're, they're all, you know, ranging from major changes to slight changes, but it, it took a long time. And it, it, it went back to that, you know, um, back and forth between Sean and I. I remember him sending me a design, and it looked, man, it looked flawless, looked fantastic, you know. 
He sent it over the mail. He was actually down in Georgia at the time, and I'm in New York. So he sent it over, and I was like, it looked perfect online. And as soon as I had it in my hand, I was like, Sean, this, this doesn't feel right, you know? <laughs> it, it's too bulky. And then, you know, the next, um, the next week, he sent me a new one. It was like, like a lot smaller. It was just, you know, that instant back and forth, that feedback, um, that made it fun. You know, I remember. And then, you know, 50, 60 design later, uh, we got to what we call design freeze. So we're, we're happy with what it currently looks like right now. If you're on video, you can, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like in my hand. So, you know, it's pretty small. It feels great. Um, but yeah, it took a long time, you know? Yeah, I can imagine. And so after all those you know, trial and errors and finding the perfect design, you guys then came to a consensus that this is kind of the product that we want to go forward with. And so what was the next step at that point? You kind of mentioned you filed for a patent. What's the patent process like? And is that a very expensive? Was it like a provisional patent or, or something more extensive, like a full-on patent? Yeah. So um, it was a utilization patent. Um, and it, it, so we, we originally started to the process on our, on our own, which proved to be pretty, um, pretty difficult. So then we actually reached out to uh, – uh, local law firm and they help us with the patent from there it actually got really easy and it was expensive honestly it was probably at the very beginning our biggest cost uh it cost us around honestly around about 10 grand um for the first one and then as we got um a better you know um connection with the firm we we filed for a second one which costed less but yeah it it was a big cost for sure and so you filed for multiple patents. Is this patenting specific components of the actual product itself, like different you know mechanisms or, or novel principles of it, or is it just two separate designs independently of each other? Yeah, so it's actually a continuation um, uh, of, uh, of the original patent that was granted. So we actually got the patent. Um, at the time, actually, um, we actually were, were able to submit for an expedited um, patent therapy because it was related to COVID. You know, so any patent being um, submitted related to COVID, the pandemic at the time, was expedited, right? So on average, you can look at about, on average, I think it's like you don't hear back from a patent about three to five years, um, but we heard back in about three to four months. Um, so uh, not lucky because, you know, but it was, you know, we, we were fortunate um, that we were able to do that. There was a silver lining, I guess, that came with the pandemic for your, right. your business uh, synthesis. And another feature that I think gets overlooked when people want to start companies is the market research that has to go into, you know, filing and getting all of this information put together. Did the company, the legal firm that you went through, do market research or ensure that there was no kind of encroachment on other patents? Or was that something that you had to do specifically? when you were starting out? Yeah, so for in terms of market research, we actually chose to do that ourselves, right? Um, the firm we worked at was awesome. They're, they kind of listed out, hey, these are typically the steps we use, we are, what we do, um, what do you guys want to do yourself? And we can like, all right, we'll do this, and then we'll save $250. And we do this, we save X amount of dollars, right? So what what my favorite part was, they were very upfront exactly with how much everything was going to cost, right? Um, <laughs> in terms of the patent search, um, we let them do that because so they did that and then they got back to us in about a week or two saying, hey, these are what we found. Um, if you want to continue forward, these are our recommendations. Um, yeah. And the market research, uh, that's that's just before we even before I even started looking at Blender, trying to come up with design. Right. Um, looking, hey, does this make sense? Like, you know, in my experience, yes. Is, uh, does it? You know, I think we need it, but is there anything out there? So all of that was done even before. And I honestly would recommend anyone starting um, to create a product or to start a startup, doing that initial research is, it's, it's you got to do it because you, the last thing you want is to be two, three years in and then realize there's not a market for it or realize, hey, there's already a product that already exists, right? So I remember going down, looking at every single reconstitution uh, medication that are used at the hospital that I was at the time. And I, I looked at, went through all of them, uh, went, looked at their shelf life and everything. So that, that, that process has to be done first. 
Yeah, it sounds pretty meticulous, but at the same time, like you said, you don't want to be two, three years into the process and turns out there, like you said, there's no market or there's no utility to the thing that you're creating, which I think could be a barrier to entry for some individuals because it's, that's not the fun part of designing and creating a product. Do you, you want to jump right to the drawing board or get to a prototyping stage? But this is some of the, the necessary steps that it sounds like um, individuals should definitely consider before jumping into it. Absolutely. And, yeah, and so at, at this point in time, you guys had talked with the uh, legal advisors and they had set up the patent process for you. At what point did you form the LLC and kind of formalize the, the entity that you were going to be operating under? Right, so during that entire process, that's we continue on refining the design, right? Um, looking for investors, um, looking into the market so that that whole pro the market research continues on you know you can't so it's like a continuation process um and we finally after we heard back saying hey like your patent pending right as soon as that pending occurs that's i mean you're either going to get the patent or you don't so you start rock and rolling you know and that's when we released the website we started llc um and to starting the llc you know that was just to give us more credibility as well, you know, and it protects you as well if anything were to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming you did the LLC in, in New York State as well. Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually formed an LLC, you know, anecdotally, and there's a lot of extra steps in New York State. So if anyone's uh, looking into doing that, you have to post a bunch of things in newspapers and stuff to formalize it. It's, it's a little antiquated, but it's a, it's a fun thing to do for sure. Um, and so. Now that you've you've built a website, and I, that's a whole process in and of itself. Yeah. Obviously, you know, there's so much like learning that needs to be done in order to like, kind of move this down the field. We're kind of covering a lot of material very quickly, but the way I understand it, it's taken years to get to that particular point. And you've moved, you know, every month is you know begrudgingly you move the ball down the field. And I guess how do you stay focused on on the topic at hand? How do you avoid kind of falling off the wagon when it came to kind of designing this product? You know, I remember when, uh, so like I mentioned, I first started this when I was in my, in pharmacy school, you know, going to pharmacy school. Then I also worked at the time and coming here, like doing Nuxo. Uh, it, it took a lot and took a lot of self-discipline. And what it, what it came down to was honestly setting a set schedule. You know, even now I still struggle with it, but having, you know, not finding uh, the perfect place, right? Not burning yourself out. And so like for me, for Nuxo anyway, I have, um, I know for Sundays when Sean and I will meet, regardless of what happened, we meet every Sunday. You know, he's down in Boston now, uh, and I'm in New York, so we, we move around a lot, but um, every Sunday, and then that kind of, that's our weekly meetup, and then we have tasks for each other, right? So at the end of every meeting, we say, hey, I'm assigning you this these tasks, all right? And, it's, and then he tells me what he wants me to do, then I tell him what happened. But I want to do so making a schedule your, uh, for yourself and then finding someone and to hold you accountable. I would say that's probably the biggest thing that we found to be working for us. Right. And recognizing that it's a marathon and, and not a sprint. So, you know, piece yeah. by piece. <laughs> Fantastic. And I, I want to explore a little bit more, too, about kind of the the other granular components of building this business. So you mentioned the prototyping phase. Do some individuals you I guess, go through prototyping companies or you were able to outsource things kind of using the uh, 3D printer model? Is that something that other individuals might have access to or where can they kind of explore those options? So we were lucky enough to have a 3D printer. Um, so, but, you know, after the first couple design, we realized that we needed more um, than just a 3D printer. So we actually were able to contact um, independent glass manufacturing company you know and they were because obviously we're making glass syringes so and if finding uh, there's a lot of uh, independent i i stress independent because they're what, what we were looking for especially in the beginning phase is someone to collaborate and work with us right and we just had better luck with honestly independently owned company so that way we can just pitch them ideas they can bring back to us tell us what's going to work for them, what's not. Um, and we work with an awesome company and, you know, they, they did exactly what we asked for. And we got, we got the product we wanted. 
And did you have to sign like a non-disclosure agreements? I know that could be something that people can get tripped up on where they just jump to a prototyping company and they forget the NDA or something along those lines. And, you know, you're at risk of losing your idea at that point in time, obviously depending, you know, whether or not you have the patent, it sounds like you might've had it at that point, but. Yeah. Even with the patent, we, um, we have every single one of our vendors sign an NDA. Right. Uh, and it's just, it's just to save, you know, to protect yourself, to protect your company. And I just don't think it's um, a bad idea. And plus, if if a company comes back and they don't want to sign it, that's, that's kind of a red flag for us anyway. So, Absolutely. So that I think that's a lot, very important uh, step in the process for sure. And so you're able to work with these prototyping companies or this glass manufacturer specifically. <clears throat> and so... I guess after you've kind of built the products and figured out like kind of the cost of kind of scaling it up at that point, cost is obviously something that you're thinking about the entire time throughout this process. What was it like finding investors and how did you go about that? Yeah. So actually, so, so cost was probably the biggest reason why we kept redesigning, right? With that in mind, every single step was how can we make this cheaper? Um, but still be, you know, um, integrable. Like it has to have, um, has to be safe, right? So, and after that, it was, um, so when we first found our original um, investors, it was actually by word of mouth. Uh, it was through our website. It was through, um, so our investors found us some, um, they saw our website, really liked it, reached out. Um, and then we, we kind of went from there. Um, and then, yeah, so we utilized LinkedIn a lot as well. So you basically found your first investors via just, you know, spontaneous marketing of the product via LinkedIn and obviously through your website. Um, has that been how you found, you know, the remaining investors or have you done a lot more, I guess, like marketing, like focus marketing, trying to find people to kind of scale up the process? Yeah. So we, um, we actually, um, from our, from our original search, we only accepted two investors and we haven't accepted any more since then. Um, and it's honestly, it's mainly because we are currently looking for more of a um, uh, uh, strategic partnership with someone, you know, because um, we want to, what the people we're looking for to bring in to be part of the team is someone who can come to the table with something. Right. Uh, so that's where we're at. And um, that's, and another option is just, we don't want to be tied down just yet too. So. Absolutely. You don't want those golden handcuffs holding you back or like having to meet, you know, with the investors and kind of maintain certain things when, you know, you're at the point of still developing and refining your, your product and, and where you want to take this company. So that makes a lot of sense. And so yeah, exactly. str strategic partnership, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that? Like, is that like marketing the product or, or things, you know, that I guess like accounting or I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So, so at first, I mean, we, we were presented, so we actually, I'll give you an example. We went to, um, we actually won the APHA um, farm tank competition, you know, mm -hmm. and we had a lot of people who were interested in investing from there. Um, but really at the time, you know, this, this was a pharmacy convention and, you know, it, it, we wanted, you know, first we have me who's, you know, I'm obviously a pharmacist. Um, and then we have Sean, who's a mechanical engineer. We are next, what we're looking for is someone who can bring something else to the table, rather it be, like you said, marketing, rather it be, you know, I've done um, prototyping before, I've done mass manufacturing before, um, something mm -hmm. that can bring us to the next step that currently we don't have. Um, that's more like the investors we're looking for next. Okay, so adding to the knowledge base so that you can kind of build out your I guess your corporate table of uh, people with their, their specialties. <clears throat> exactly. And so, yeah. Yeah. So that, that's super interesting. And I recall you, you mentioning too, just like with investors, I think it was, you said one of the challenges was that you would get people, you know, saying, Oh, I can throw you $500 and I want 50% of the company. You know, that's, that doesn't sound like a very productive use of your time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, we got probably the most common offer we got was, Hey, I'll invest ten thousand dollars for five percent, or I'll invest twenty thousand dollars for twenty percent. You know, like those. in it, it was that. Uh, if you think about it, you know, well, first of all, if I, what am I going to do with a hundred thousand dollars and no company, right? Um, <laughs> so, 
So it, it wasn't, it didn't make sense. Um, and that's kind of the reason why we move our focus toward finding investors that share the same dream as us rather than someone just throwing money at us. You know, I think in terms of long-term goal, that's going to help the company more than just petty cash at this point. Yeah, exactly. You're, you don't need to crowdfund at this point. That's more so once you have the infrastructure to, to really, really scale up to a massive, like, you know, international size at that point. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then, and what people, what, well, honestly, what we didn't realize at first is that if you're going to go into the medical um, device field, it, we are no longer talking about ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, right? We're talking about, honestly, uh, there, there's companies out there that we reach out to for manufacturers that won't even reply back to us unless we can prove that we have over $500,000 in the bank. Right. So, yeah. So these are like the field we've <laughs> into, entered into is it's a pretty tough field. So that's why at this point, you know, it's more, it's more that strategic partnership we're looking for. Absolutely. And obviously that's a pretty large uh, barrier to entry when it comes to, you know, product design and, there's a lot of like regulation and extra things that I, I can imagine you have to deal with. And so as an alternative uh, to kind of, you know, getting to that $500,000 thresh threshold, have you considered other ways of, you know, raising funding like NIH grants or national science foundation applications, or even like clinical trial bids or something along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually, it's funny you mentioned that. That's exactly where we are right now. You know, we are at, um, we've, we're putting in our application for NSF and an NIH. Um, and at, at this, it, the process is actually pretty well organized and laid out, you know. Um, so we're excited to hear back and see where that leads. But yeah, searching for government and um, grants is definitely our current step. We are also working with, you know, um, incubators um, and stuff and places like that. So uh, we're excited to see what the next few months is going to take us for sure. So how long does it take for some of those, uh, like the NSF, you know, applications take for turnaround time? Is it relatively quick or are you sitting there twiddling your thumbs for years at a time? So the program, it typically, I, so from the moment you submit your, um, I guess your, your uh, pitch, your pitch, it, it takes about a month for them to say yes, no, we're interested for not. And then after that, they either say, hey, we are interested, please submit a more, um, um, like, you know, more detailed version. And then from there, it takes about six months to hear back. Um, and then after that, it's kind of about, so I would say about a year-ish, to um, le a little bit less than a year to hear back. Um, so it can be, you know, at some point, it's like, oh, man, like, you did all this work and you're just waiting to hear back. I'm like checking my email like 10 times a day, you know. <laughs> it's like that hur hurry up and wait, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, so, exactly. Oh, wow. So I, I can imagine these applications are pretty extensive. Um, you know, I talk about medical school applications, but <laughs> I can imagine this is probably 10 times worse. Um, and so with that said, too, I, I think when it comes to building like a pharmaceutical device, I can imagine that there is quite a bit of regulation that goes into this. You're not exactly like building like, you know, a teddy bear or the newest fidget spinner on the market. You're, you're building something that's going to potentially administer medications to a patient. And so I can imagine there's a lot more like legal hurdles that you're going to have to jump through when it comes to kind of getting this moved um, to the market. And so I'm assuming that it has to go through like a, obviously clinical trials and an FDA approval process. Is that the next step after you get some of this NIH funding? Yeah, absolutely. So we are, we currently, we are, um, where we have options to partner up, partner up with a third party, you know, and we, we found, and it's all of this research and all of this stuff has to be, has to happen before you can apply, right? Because you have to tell, like, you have to justify why you need this amount of money. You have to tell NSF, like, hey, I'm going to use it for X, Y, and Z. You know, you can't wait for the money and say, <laughs> Okay, what now? So all of that, that's one of the reasons why it takes us so long before we apply and everything, because we have to work all of this out. Um, and luckily, we were able to find um, a, a small firm that does FDA um, approval, um, that helps with FDA approval process. And just working with them has been great, you know. Um, so, yeah, and that's finding that. I, I remember when I, we first were searching for, um, for help with the FDA process, there is a lot of company out there 
And we, there was, I had like, at one point, over eight different companies are reaching out, wanting to join us. But we, you know, finding, finding the right partnership again, it's, it's key. And we really do take that seriously. So. Alrighty. So, and I think that's fantastic. So it's often easy too, to, to follow like step-by-step -step instructions online. And uh, I think, you know, real learning is achieved obviously from making personal mistakes. So what are the biggest mistakes that you've made in this journey and how have you come out better because of them? Right. Yeah. That's, uh, man, that's an excellent question. And honestly, we, we made, we made, um, we made a lot of mistakes, you know, as most startups do. Um, the biggest one I would probably say it's, you know, time management. Like I, I know we mentioned that earlier today, but not burning yourself out, you know, that whole, Hey, I'm going to work, you know, 80, 120 hours a week, you know, and then kind of getting, not getting, not producing the best work that you could, if you were to honestly just take a day off. You know, I remember we were kind of in the very beginning, we were just, we were both burnt out between school work and this. Um, and then at one point we, we were just kind of like in a rut where we were like, wow, we haven't heard back from any investors. Uh, we don't have any new idea for designs, you know, and it was just like, what do we do? Like, is this it? You know, we, and we took uh, probably five days off and came back and we were like, I had this great idea, you know, this, this, and this. And then it was just, it was just like such an eye opener and saying, Hey, like, don't it's like you said it's a marathon not a race not, not a sprint you know and and now now we work you know we work three days a week on nuxo um and then and when we need to we increase it to four days a week but being able to balance that out in the very beginning and taking care of your mental and physical health was a big one um and i i honestly would recommend everybody taking that to, into account especially when you're starting out uh you do your best work when you're well rested for sure yeah, I could not, um, then, could not agree more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know as someone, you know, you have your own business too. I, I'm sure you experienced that. So, um, and our, our, our next mistake was honestly just being able to, um, I guess when you first start, you know, it was just, Hey, I, 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 you have this envision in your head and you don't always have everything worked out, you know, to define details, right? Like, for example, we talked about getting a grant. Right, saying, "Oh, I need five hundred thousand dollars," but then when the investor is sitting in front of you and they say, "Okay, well, tell me how you're going to spend every single penny of it," right? You have <laughs> to have a, a, like a solid answer, not just, "Oh, well, we're going to spend about ten thousand here, about twenty thousand here," you know? Like, so I remember our first couple investors meeting, and we just got destroyed, man. Like, these were, you know, very powerful, important people. Just like, hey, you guys. What are you guys talking about? You know, and that that was a big um, eye opener for sure. And then we went back to we we spent the last six months um, figuring out every single step to the minute detail. So taking the time to do that was is definitely important. You know, and now now at our pitch deck, you know, we know exactly how we're going to spend our money. We know every single step that we're going to take. And even then, I I bet you three months from now, if you ask me, I'm going to be taking you know, oh, this didn't work out, that didn't work out. But honestly, just planning forward more, it's probably, I would recommend doing that. Yeah, a lot of great things you just mentioned there. And I think a lot of people need to kind of rewind that for a second. And they're, I guess they should appreciate how important it is to take some time away just with anything. It doesn't have to be creating a business, but sometimes it sounds like for yourself, you hit a wall when you were, when it came to designing and sometimes you just need to take a step away and that clarity that you experience on the back end is so, so important. And then additionally, I think for new, you know, creators and people who are trying to bring something to the market, especially someone, you know, fresh out of college, um, it could be very overwhelming to sit behind this big desk and have to explain the vision that you have and articulate all those major points to people who are going to throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at you. And it sounds like that was a major learning you know, lesson that you had to kind of go through the hard way, unfortunately. Um, but, and, and then lastly, just to kind of, you know, tie it all off, you've learned from that mistake and then you've built basically some infrastructure into your business plan where you plan out each step of the way. So you don't just have a weekly plan or goals that you want to accomplish. You have a six month plan. And my follow-up question to that is how often do you up, I guess, like update these goals? 
is it based off of the progress that you make or is it more so you have like a set we hit six months let's recycle and just sit down and plan out the next six months how, how does it go for you yeah so these these are ever-changing goals you know depending on how um how we're doing um and it, it constantly changes you know and i think that's part of the part of the um the struggle really it's not not everything always always going to work out you know certain design just won't for um a lot of our original design you know when we when we started just oh this is a great design but it, it's impossible to mass manufacture right so like now all of, all of a sudden our six months plan just went out the window and we're back to square one um so just being flexible and understanding that that's just the nature of a startup um i think that's yeah so we and we but i do um agree with saying that we had long-term and short-term goals right uh your long-term goal really should if they're good goals they, they should not change that often so our long-term goals are still the same you know to get this into the market um to help the community uh and that's our that's kind of our long long-term goal and then as how do we get there that's going to change Alrighty, so we've had the opportunity to to look at the creation of your business and the product creation details at a pretty granular level. And I, I'd like to close out this interview with a few final questions about your outlook for your company and kind of re reflect on the journey as a whole. So looking ahead, how do you envision this device changing the pharmaceutical workflow? Yeah, I mean, looking ahead, I, I would love to be able to, you know, in three, five years from now, to be able to walk into a local community pharmacy and see it be used to walk into a hospital and then see it be used, you know, that would be incredible. Um, but how do I see it change the, um, the practice, the current practice? I think well, first uh, it, it offers a couple advantages, right? I think that uh, we designed the device to first to help eliminate um, potential med error, you know, someone mixing the wrong diluent with the, um, the drug powder, you know that that's out of the door now, right? Because it comes in into a single device. Um, next, decrease waste, right? How how often does a hospital or a pharmacy mix a drug and then it's not used, right? Oftentimes, as soon as you mix those two drugs, they're they're only good for about a day or even less, depending on the drug. Um, so, you know, decreasing waste, decreasing um, the manpower to to mix decreasing the specialized training to be able to reconstitute drugs. Uh, all that goes out the window um, if this goes into market. So it's going to increase workflow, man. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make it more effective. It's going to save people money. And that's, that's probably the most exciting thing about it. I'm sure retail is going to love you. And I think there's going to be a lot of utility, too, in the hospital setting, um, especially when there's, you know, acute codes or things where a medication needs to be reconstituted immediately instead of having to fumble with the syringe. Like you were saying, individuals will just be able to kind of pop the, the system and allow the obviously the material to mix and then they'll be ready to inject. So that's it's really exciting stuff right there. And. I also want to kind of explore a little bit. So obviously running a company is no easy task and the initial stages are often the hardest. So I mean, at this point, you don't really have the capital to comfortably outsource or the staffing infrastructure to delegate to others. So every step that you kind of move the ball down the field has been through your own kind of volition or through Sean's input as well. And the reality of this situation often forces creators to invest most of their time into the, the development but I'd like to know how you balance the demands of running a startup with other responsibilities and interests outside of work. You kind of mentioned already that you kind of delegate certain days, but what has that been like? Yeah, I mean, it's, it keeps you busy for sure. That's one thing. Um, but, you know, it's just, it all, honestly, it's all possible by going back to your long-term goal, right? If you have a long-term goal that you're passionate about, you're going to be able to overcome these hurdles. You're going to be able to come, hey, I'm working, you know, more, I'm working 60 hours this week, but, but this is what I'm working toward. Um, I think that my, my recommendation and my, uh, or anyone who's starting a startup is that before you do anything, what do you want? You know, come up with that goal because it's going to be tough and you're going to face a lot of struggles. But if you have, if you're passionate enough and you have a clear idea of what you want, I think that's going to get you through it. I love that. And I guess to follow up with that, do you have any last minute advice for any other pharmacists who are out there who think they have like a grand idea, 
how, what kind of things do you think they should do as their first initial steps to kind of move forward with this process? You said identify the goals of where they want to take it. So what, what's the first, I guess, actionable step that you think that they should pursue? Right. The first step, don't sit on it, right? Don't, ah, oh, man, I, this is a great idea. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look into this later. You know, no, like as, as soon as you come up with a great idea, my recommend is you, you follow it through, you become obsessed with it and, and just keep going. You know, I think my rec is just, just to capitalize on your idea. You know, there's a lot of people who there are who are way more successful than I'll ever be. And it's all because they just, they had a great idea at one point and they capitalized. So why, why can't we be one of those, right? Would be my rec um, recommendation to any other pharmacy. Um, most, you know, all pharmacists are intelligent people. So believing in your idea, believing in what you can do and your capability. Um, so as soon as you, that, it just takes one, right? As soon as you have that one good idea, go out, take a look. First, you know, like we mentioned, do the market research. Does this make sense to pursue um, and work through it? I love that. And obviously don't quit your day job until you've kind of moved into the, the profitable stage. But it's uh, that's <laughs> something that's super important too, is to, like you said, just to go for it. You know, you're, you're going to be sitting there 10 years down the line, either thinking, I wish I'd done this, or you're going to see someone else already did it for you. <laughs> exactly. All righty. Well, we've come to the end of our interview today, and I'd like to thank all of our listeners for the support. If you have any additional questions about the medical school journey or other non-traditional pharmacy careers, check out my website at www.physicianpharmacist.com. Before we let you go, Dr. Chen, how can our listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? Yeah, you can reach me at nook at nookso.com or check out my website at www.nookso.com. All righty. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I recognize you're an extremely busy individual, and I really do appreciate your time. Awesome, man. Thanks for, ha thanks for having me. All right. Good to see you. Take care.